Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. So today on the podcast, we're taking uh, ourselves down a little different route for a change, and we're going to look at the Queen and Sault Ste. Marie, which is the landmark case that establishes strict liability. So Zach, what do we know about strict liability? I know the most about strict liability from spending my time at Community Legal Aid. Yes. And I won't name any names, but I'm going to do a <laughs> brief little anecdotal story about strict liability. Please do. I had a client. <laughs> yeah, a, a client had violated the terms of the HTA. They were speeding. Mm-hmm. I approached the supervising lawyer and asked about defenses. And the supervising lawyer simply looked at me and said, if the radar gun says he did it and there's no proof the radar gun didn't demonstrate it was faulty he probably did it so let's see if we could talk to the crown about cutting a deal (laughs) i I was like oh like that's all there is to strict liability that's it if it happened then you're found guilty there's no there's no did you intend to do it criminally yeah no what you intended to do is pretty irrelevant with strict liability your only defense to something in strict liability is if you did due diligence. So uh, in my current work, this comes up a lot. It's my sort of bread and butter is Sault Ste. Marie. And yes, that'll be your your defense. The only actual defense to strict liability is due diligence. So you say, you know, look, I did X, Y, Z and beyond to keep myself in compliance with the statute and regulation and the thing happened anyway. So you can say, well, uh, you know, what else was I really supposed to do? I did my due diligence. Sometimes things just happen. And so it's not absolute liability. It's not like if it happened, you're donezo, but it is strict liability. So unless you can show that you took all the reasonable precautions and the circumstances and that you did your due diligence, you will likely be found guilty of the offense. I find I find this one just like anecdotally from my time at the clinic and currently at work. This is a hard one to explain to the public. I find this is something that the public doesn't understand that well because it's not an intuitive concept, right? Like, you know, at your average John Q public will say, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to do it. It was a complete and total accident. And you kind of have to explain, well, I I understand that it was an accident, but there's, you know, sort of X, Y, Z that should have been in place and it wasn't. So unfortunately, the thing happened and that means that you're liable under strict liability. I find, yeah, the public does not like this one, Zach. (laughs) No, no. And for... For obvious reasons, the public doesn't like it. But on the flip side, from like a uh, like a government standpoint or like a prosecutorial standpoint or even a standpoint holding people responsible for events, it, it makes sense. And it the fact that it provides a benefit of the due diligence defense, I think also kind of serves as that public policy goal because sometimes things happen and the, the rules are broken. But sometimes they were like you couldn't have prevented it. But then there are circumstances where, you know, a load wasn't secured in accordance with regulations and then something horrible happens. Right. Then due diligence wouldn't happen. But if the load was properly secured and it wasn't a true accident, then why should a person be guilty? Right. Oh, no, definitely. It, it, it makes sense, but it's it's hard to yes, it's express hard. sometimes. It's hard to conceptualize. Well, because it is so different from the code, right? Like, obviously, the way liability works for assault is not the way liability works for an environmental offense. Like, they're not the same. But in, take uh, given to what you were just saying, the public interest is a huge factor with lots of the statutes where strict liability applies, right? You know, health, environment, labor. Like, these are statutes that have a public interest mandate. So the application of a strict liability standard makes more sense in that context because they are wholly a public interest statute. And that, you know, that's what happened in Sault Ste. Marie, right? Like it's an environmental spill. And so it's coming out of a situation yeah. where it would still apply, right? It's going to apply in environmental contexts with the Ministry of Environment all the time. They are strict liability mm-hmm. offenses. So I think once you sort of explain the background to everything and why strict liability applies with these particular types of offenses and that sort of thing, it can make more sense to people, but it's still, sometimes it can still be a hard pill 
to swallow for some people because they might have thought they yes. did their due diligence, but they might actually not have done due diligence in accordance with the statute or the regulation. So it can be a little tricky sometimes, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that's the law. Yeah. It was, oh, wham. Well, hashtag, hashtag to podcast. Hashtag that's the law. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you have any interest in sort of municipal law or regulatory offenses, anything like that, Sault Ste. Marie is your case. So we're going to leave it at that and we hope you enjoy. The Queen and Sue St. Marie. On appeal from the Court of Appeal for Ontario. The judgment of the court was delivered by Justice Dixon. In the present appeal, the court is concerned with offenses variously referred to as statutory, public welfare, regulatory, absolute liability, or strict responsibility, which are not criminal in any real sense, but are prohibited in the public interest. Although enforces penal laws through the utilization of the machinery of the criminal law, the offenses are in substance of a civil nature and might well be regarded as a branch of administrative law to which traditional principles of criminal law have but limited application. They relate to such everyday matters as traffic infractions, sales of impure food, violations of liquor laws, and the like. In this appeal, we are concerned with pollution. The doctrine of the guilty mind expressed in terms of intention or recklessness, but not negligence, is at the foundation of the law of crimes. In the case of true crimes, there is a presumption that a person should not be held liable for the wrongfulness of his act if that act is without mens rea. Blackstone made the point over 200 years ago in his words still apt, quote, to constitute a crime against human law, there must be first a vicious will, and secondly, an unlawful act consequent upon such vicious will, end quote. I would emphasize at the outset that nothing in the discussion which follows is intended to dilute or erode that basic principle. The appeal raises a preliminary issue as to whether the charge as laid is duplicitous, and if so, whether sections 732.1 and 755.4 of the Criminal Code preclude the accused City of Sault Ste. Marie from raising the duplicity claim for the first time on appeal. It will be convenient to deal first with this preliminary point and then consider the concept of liability in relation to public welfare offenses. The city of Sault Ste. Marie was charged that it did discharge or caused to be discharged or permitted to be discharged or deposited materials into Cannon Creek and Root River or on the shore or bank thereof or in such a place along the side that might impair the quality of the water in Cannon Creek and Root River between March 13, 1972 and September 11, 1972. The charge was laid under Section 32.1 of the Ontario Water Resources Commission Act, which provides so far as relevant that every municipality or person that discharges or deposits or causes or permits the discharge or deposit of any material of any kind into any water course or on any shore or bank thereof, or in any place that may impair the quality of water, is guilty of an offense, and on summary conviction, is liable on first conviction to a fine of not more than $5,000, and on each subsequent conviction to a fine of not more than $10,000, or to imprisonment for a term of not more than one year, or to both fine and imprisonment. Although the facts do not rise above the routine, The proceedings have to date had the anxious consideration of five courts. The city was acquitted in Provincial Court Criminal Division, but convicted following a trial de novo on a Crown appeal. A further appeal by the city to the Divisional Court was allowed and the conviction quashed. The Court of Appeal for Ontario on yet another appeal directed a new trial. Because of the importance of the legal issues, this court granted leave to the Crown to appeal and leave to the city to cross appeal. To relate briefly the facts, the city on November 18, 1970, entered into an agreement with the Cherokee Disposal and Construction Company Limited for the disposal of all refuse originating in the city. 
Under the terms of the agreement, Cherokee became obligated to furnish a site in adequate labor, material, and equipment. The site selected bordered Cannon Creek, which, it would appear, runs into the Root River. The method of disposal adopted is known as the area or continuous slope method of sanitary landfill, whereby garbage is compacted in layers which are covered each day by natural sand or gravel. Prior to 1970, the site had been covered with a number of freshwater springs that flowed into Cannon Creek. Cherokee dumped material to cover and submerge these springs and then placed garbage and wastes over such material. The garbage and wastes in due course formed a high mound sloping steadily toward and within 20 feet of the creek. Pollution resulted. Cherokee was convicted of a breach of Section 32.1 of the Ontario Water Resources Commission Act, the section under which the city has been charged. The question now before the court is whether the city is also guilty of an offence under that section. In dismissing the charge at first instance, the judge found that the city had nothing to do with the actual disposal operations, that Cherokee was an independent contractor and its employees were not employees of the city. On the appeal de novo, Judge Vanini found the offence to be one of strict liability and he convicted. The divisional court, in setting aside the judgment, found that the charge was duplicitous. As a secondary point, the divisional court also held that the charge required mens rea with respect to causing or permitting a discharge. When the case reached the Court of Appeal, that court held that the conviction could not be quashed on the ground of duplicity because there had been no challenge to the information at trial. The Court of Appeal agreed, however, that the trial charge was one requiring proof of mens rea. A majority of the court, Appeal Justices Brooke and Howland, held that there was not sufficient evidence to establish mens rea and ordered a new trial. In the view of Mr. Justice La Croussière, dissenting, the inescapable inference to be drawn from the findings of fact of Judge Vanini was that the city had known of the potential impairment of waters of Cannon Creek and Root River and had failed to exercise its clear powers of control. The diverse judicial opinions to date on the points under consideration reflect the dubiety in these breaches of the law. The duplicity point. Turning then to the question of duplicity and whether the information charged the city with several offenses or merely one offense which might be committed in different modes. The argument is that Section 32.1 of the Ontario Resources Commission Act charges three offenses. One, discharging. Two, causing to be discharged. Three, permitting to be discharged. Deleterious materials. The applicable principle is well established. If the information in one court charges more than one offense, it is bad for duplicity. The rule against multiplicity of charges and an information is contained in Section 724.1 of the Code. Section 731A provides, however, that no information shall be deemed to charge two offenses by reason only that it states that the alleged offense was committed in different modes. Several tests have been suggested for determining whether an indictment or information is multiplicitous. Probably the best-known test is that enunciated by Justice Avery in the Queen and Surrey Justices' ex parte Witherick. The charge was that of driving without due care and attention and without reasonable consideration for other persons. Justice Avery said that if a person may do one without the other, it followed, as a matter of law, that an information which charged him in the alternative would be bad. In the Queen and Madill, Appeal Justice Ford applied the test of whether evidence can be given of distinct acts committed by the person charged, constituting two or more offenses. And in the Queen and International Nickel Company of Canada, Appeal Justice Arnup expressed the view that if a section containing two or more elements is to be construed as containing only one offense, one must be able to state with precision the essence of the single offense. Each of these tests is helpful as far as it goes, but each is too general to provide a clear demarcation in concrete instances. This is shown by the variety of cases and the diversity of opinion in the case itself. To resolve the matter, one must recall, I think, the policy basis of the rule against multiplicity and duplicity. 
The rule developed during a period of extreme formality and technicality in the preferring of indictments and laying of information. It grew from the humane desire of judges to alleviate the severity of the law in an age when many crimes were still classified as felonies, for which the punishment was death by the gallows. The slightest defect made an indictment a nullity. That age has passed. Parliament has made it abundantly clear in those sections of the criminal code having to do with the form of indictments and informations that the punctillo of an earlier age is no longer to bind us. We must look for substance and not petty formalities. The duplicity role has been justified on two grounds. To be fair to the accused in the preparation of his defense and to enable him to plead atra fa convict in the future. As Justice Avery said in the Queen and Surrey Justices ex parte Witherick, it is an elementary principle that an information must not charge offenses in the alternative since the defendant cannot then know with precision with what he is charged and of what he is convicted and may be prevented on a future occasion from pleading autrefois convict. The problem of raising a defense of autrefois convict is illusory even when there is duplicity. It is difficult to see as a practical matter where the Crown would begin new proceedings after having just concluded a successful prosecution. Even if there were a prosecution, it could not succeed. Assume conviction of the city on a charge of discharging, causing discharge of, permitting discharge of pollutant at a started time and place. If another charge were laid at a later date in respect of one, two, or three, as related to the same pollutant and the same time and place, the new charge would be based on the same cause or matter which had already formed the basis of a conviction and a further conviction would be barred. It is equally clear that no problem of ultrafa acquit arises, even where there is duplicity, because an acquittal means acquittal on all the offenses charged, and thus there is no difficulty in raising the defense of ultrafa acquit to a later charge of one and the same offenses alone. In my opinion, the primary test should be a practical one, based on the only valid justification for the rule against duplicity, does the accused know the case he has to meet, or is he prejudiced in the preparation of his defense by ambiguity in the charge? Viewed in that light, as well as by the other tests mentioned above, I think we must conclude that the charge in the present case was not duplicitous. There is nothing ambiguous or uncertain in the charge. The city knew the case it had to meet. Section 32.1 of the Ontario Water Resources Commission Act is concerned with only one matter, pollution. That is the gist of the charge and the evil against which the offense is aimed. One cognate act is the subject of the prohibition. Only one generic offense was charged, the essence of which was polluting, and that offense could be committed in one or more of several modes. There is nothing wrong in specifying alternative methods of committing an offense or in embellishing the periphery, provided only one offense is to be found at the focal point of the charge. Furthermore, although not determinative, it is not irrelevant that the information has been laid in the precise words of the section. I am satisfied that the legislature did not intend to create different offenses for polluting, dependent upon whether one deposited or caused to be deposited or permitted to be deposited. The legislation is aimed at one class of offender only, those who pollute. In the Queen and Matzbeck Construction Company Limited, Justice Hughes considered the very section now under study and adopting the approach I favor, concluded that the charge was not duplicitous. The judge said, there can be no doubt in the mind of accused that he is charged with having one mode or another, discharged or deposited material into water, and that this material may have impaired its quality. On the other hand, the English case of Ross Hillman Limited and Bond, where very similar language was used, Justice May said that the act created three distinct types of offense. I think that the authority of the English case in this area of the law must be carefully considered and their aid discounted to the extent that the statutory provisions applicable differ from those contained in our code. I conclude that the charge in this case is not duplicitous. It is unnecessary, therefore, to consider whether a defendant can raise a duplicity objection for the first time on appeal. The mens rea point. The distinction between the true criminal offense and the public welfare offense is one of prime importance. 
Where the offense is criminal, the Crown must establish a mental element, namely, that the accused who committed the prohibited act did so intentionally or recklessly, with knowledge of the facts constituting the offense, or with willful blindness towards them. Mere negligence is excluded from the concept of the mental element required for conviction. Within the context of a criminal prosecution, a person who fails to make such inquiries as a reasonable and prudent person would make, or who fails to know the facts he should have known, is innocent in the eyes of the law. In sharp contrast, absolute liability entails conviction on proof merely that the defendant committed the prohibited act constituting the actus reus of the offense. There is no relevant mental element. It is no defense that the accused was entirely without fault. He may be morally innocent in every sense, yet branded as a malefactor and punished as such. Public welfare offenses obviously lie in a field of conflicting values. It is essential for society to maintain, through effective enforcement, high standards of public health and safety. Potential victims of those who carry on latently pernicious activities have a strong claim to consideration. On the other hand, there is a generally held revulsion against punishment of the morally innocent. Public welfare offenses evolved in mid-19th century Britain as a means of doing away with the requirement of mens rea for petty police offenses. The concept was a judicial creation, founded on expediency. That concept is now firmly embedded in the concrete of Anglo-American and Canadian jurisprudence, its importance heightened by the ever-increasing complexities of modern society. Various arguments are advanced in justification of absolute liability in public welfare offenses. Two, predominate. Firstly, it is argued that the protection of social interests requires a high standard of care and attention on the part of those who follow certain pursuits, and such persons are more likely to be stimulated to maintain those standards if they know that ignorance or mistake will not excuse them. The removal of any possible loophole acts, it is said, as an incentive to take precautionary measures beyond what would otherwise be taken in order that mistakes and mishaps be avoided. The second main argument is one based on administrative efficiency. Having regard to both the difficulty of proving mental culpability and the number of petty cases which daily come before the courts, proof of fault is just too great a burden in time and money to place upon the prosecution. To require proof of each person's individual intent would allow almost every violator to escape. This, together with the glut of work entailed in proving mens rea in every case, would clutter the docket and impede adequate enforcement as virtually to nullify the regulatory statutes. In short, absolute liability, it is contended, is the most effective and efficient way of ensuring compliance with minor regulatory legislation, and the social ends to be achieved are of such importance as to override the unfortunate byproduct of punishing those who may be free of moral turpitude. In further justification, it is urged that slight penalties are usually imposed and that the conviction for breach of a public welfare offense does not carry the stigma associated with conviction for a criminal offense. Arguments of greater force are advanced against absolute liability. The most telling thing is that it violates fundamental principles of penal liability. It also rests upon assumptions which have not been and cannot be empirically established. There is no evidence that a higher standard of care results from absolute liability. If a person is already taking every reasonable precautionary measure, is he likely to take additional measures knowing that however much care he takes, it will not serve as a defense in the event of a breach? If he has exercised care and skill, will conviction have a deterrent effect upon him or others? Will the injustice of conviction lead to cynicism and disrespect for the law on his part and on the part of others? These are among the questions asked. The argument that no stigma attaches does not withstand analysis, for the accused will have suffered loss of time, legal costs, exposure to the processes of the criminal law at trial, and, however one may downplay, the opprobrium of conviction. It is now sufficient to say that the public interest is engaged and, therefore, liability may be imposed without fault. In serious crimes, the public interest is involved and mens rea must be proven. The administrative argument has little force. 
In sentencing, evidence of due diligence is admissible and therefore the evidence might just as well be heard when considering guilt. Additionally, it may be noted that Section 198 of the Highway Traffic Act of Alberta provides that upon a person being charged with an offense under the Act, if the judge trying the case is of the opinion that the offense A was committed wholly by accident or misadventure and without negligence, and B could not by the exercise of reasonable care or precaution have been avoided, the judge may dismiss the case. See also Section 232 of the Manitoba Highway Traffic Act which has a similar effect. In these instances at least, the legislature has indicated that administrative efficiency does not foreclose inquiry as to fault. It is also worthy of note that historically the penalty for breach of statutes enacted for the regulation of individual conduct in the interests of health and safety was minor, $20 or $25. Today, it may amount to thousands of dollars and entail the possibility of imprisonment for a second conviction. The present case is an example. Public welfare offenses involve a shift of emphasis from the protection of individual interests to the protection of public and social interests. The unfortunate tendency in many past cases has been to see the choice as between two stark alternatives, full mens rea or absolute liability. In respect of public welfare offenses, within which category pollution offenses fall, where full mens rea is not required, absolute liability has often been imposed. English jurisprudence has consistently maintained this dichotomy. There has, however, been an attempt in Australia, in many Canadian courts, and indeed in England, to seek a middle position, fulfilling the goals of public welfare offences while still not punishing the entirely blameless. There is an increasing and impressive stream of authority which holds that where an offence does not require full mens rea, it is nevertheless a good defense for the defendant to prove that he was not negligent. Dr. Glanville Williams has written, There is a halfway house between mens rea and strict responsibility which has not yet been properly utilized, and that is responsibility for negligence. Morris and Howard, in Studies in Criminal Law, suggests that strict responsibility might with advantage be replaced by a doctrine of responsibility for negligence strengthened by a shift in the burden of proof. The defendant would be allowed to exculpate himself by proving affirmatively that he was not negligent. Professor Howard offers the comment that English law of strict responsibility in minor statutory offenses is distinguished only by its irrationality and then has this to say in support of the position taken by the Australian High Court. Quote, over a period of nearly 60 years since its inception, the High Court has adhered with consistency to the principle that there should be no criminal responsibility without fault, however minor the offense. It has done so by utilizing the very halfway house to which Dr. Williams refers, responsibility for negligence, end quote. In his work, Public Welfare Offenses, Professor Sayers suggests that if the penalty is really slight involving, for instance, a maximum fine of $25, particularly if adequate enforcement depends upon wholesale prosecution, or if the social danger arising from the violation is serious, the doctrine of basing liability upon mere activity rather than fault is sound. He continues, however, on the other hand, some public welfare offenses involve a possible penalty of imprisonment or heavy fine. In such cases, it would seem sounder policy to maintain the orthodox requirement of a guilty mind, but to shift the burden of proof to the shoulders of the defendant to establish his lack of a guilty intent if he can. For public welfare offenses, defendants may be convicted by proof of the mere act of violation. But if the offense involves a possible prison penalty, the defendant should not be denied the right of bringing forward affirmative evidence to prove that the violation was the result of no fault on his part. It is fundamentally unsound to convict a defendant for a crime involving a substantial term of imprisonment without giving him the opportunity to prove that his action was due to an honest and reasonable mistake of fact or that he acted without guilty intent. If the public danger is widespread and serious, the practical situation can be met by shifting the shoulders of the defendant the burden of proving lack of guilty intent. 
The doctrine proceeds on the assumption that the defendant could have avoided the prima facie offense through the exercise of reasonable care, and he is given the opportunity of establishing, if he can, that he did in fact exercise such care. The case which gave the lead in this branch of the law is the Australian case of Proudman and Damon, where Justice Dixon said, It is one thing to deny that a necessary ingredient of the offense is positive knowledge of the fact that the driver holds no subsisting license. It is another to say that an honest belief founded on reasonable grounds that he is licensed cannot exculpate a person who permits him to drive. As a general rule, an honest and reasonable belief in a state of facts which, if they existed, would make the defendant's act innocent, affords an excuse for doing what would otherwise be an offense. This case, and several others like it, speak of the defense as being that of a reasonable mistake of fact. The reason is that the offenses in question have generally turned on the possession by a person or place of an unlawful status, and the accused defense was that he reasonably did not know of this status, e.g. permitting an unlicensed person to drive or lacking a valid license oneself, or being the owner of property in a dangerous condition. In such cases, negligence consists of an unreasonable failure to know the facts which constitute the offense. It is clear, however, that in principle the defense is that all reasonable care was taken. In other circumstances, the issue will be whether the accused's behavior was negligent in bringing about the forbidden event when he knew the relevant facts. Once the defense of reasonable mistake of fact is accepted, there is no barrier to acceptance of the other constituent part of a defense of due diligence. The principle which has found acceptance in Australia since Proudman and Damon has a place also in the jurisprudence of New Zealand. In the House of Lords case of Sweet and Parsley, Lord Reed noted the difficulty presented by the simplistic choice between mens rea in the full sense and an absolute offense. He looked approvingly at attempts to find a middle ground. Lord Pierce, in the same case, referred to the sensible halfway house which he thought the courts should take in some so-called absolute offenses. The difficulty, as Lord Pierce saw it, lay in the opinion of Viscount Sankley, in Wilmington and Director of Public Prosecutions, if the full width of that opinion were maintained. Lord Diplock, however, took a different, and in my opinion, a preferable view. Wilmington's case did not decide anything so irrational as that the prosecution might evidence to prove the absence of any mistaken belief by the accused in the existence of facts which, if true, would make the act innocent any more than it decided that the prosecution must call evidence to prove the absence of any claim of right in a charge of larceny, the jury is entitled to presume that the accused acted with the knowledge of the facts, unless there is some evidence to the contrary, originating from the accused who alone can know on what belief he acted, and on what ground the belief, if mistaken, was held. In Wilmington's case, the question was whether the trial judge was correct in directing the jury that the accused was required to prove his innocence. Viscount Sankey referred to the strength of the presumption of innocence in a criminal case and then made the statement universally accepted in this country that there is no burden on the prisoner to prove his innocence. It is sufficient for him to raise a doubt as to his guilt. I do not understand the case as standing for anything more than that. It is to be noted that the case is concerned with criminal offenses in the true sense. It is not concerned with public welfare offenses. It is somewhat ironic that Wilmington's case, which embodies a principle for the benefit of the accused, should be used to justify the rejection of a defense of reasonable care for public welfare offenses and the retention of absolute liability, which affords the accused no defense at all. There is nothing in Wilmington's case, as I comprehend it, which stands in the way of adoption, in respect of regulatory offenses, of a defense in due care, with burden of proof resting on the accused to establish the defense on a balance of probabilities. There have been several cases in Ontario which open the way to acceptance of a defense of due diligence. In the Queen and McIver, the Court of Appeal held that the offense charged, namely careless driving, was one of strict liability, but that it was open to an accused to show that he had a reasonable belief in the facts which, if true, would have rendered the act innocent. Appeal Justice McKay, who wrote for the court, 
relied upon Shiraz and Darutzin, Proudman and Damon, Maker and Mussin, and the Queen and Patterson, in availing an accused to the opportunity of explanation in the case of statutory offenses that do not by their terms require proof of intent. The following two short passages from the judgment might be quoted. On a charge laid under Section 60 of the Highway Traffic Act, it is open to the accused as a defense to show an absence of negligence on his part. For example, that his conduct was caused by the negligence of some other person, or by showing that the cause was a mechanical failure or other circumstance that he could not reasonably have foreseen. In the present case, it was open to the accused to show if he could that the collision of his car with the car parked on the shoulder of the road occurred without fault or negligence on his part. He, having failed to do so, was properly convicted. An appeal to this court was dismissed on other grounds. Later, in the Queen and Cousteau, Appeal Justice McKay again, speaking for the court, returned to the same point. In the case of an offense of strict liability, it has been held to be a defense if it is found that the defendant honestly believed on reasonable grounds in a state of facts which, if true, would render his act an innocent one. In the British Columbia Court of Appeal, the concept of reasonable care was discussed in the Queen and La Roque by Mr. Justice Shepherd, speaking for the court. Quote, the test has been identified in Bank of New South Wales and Piper. Quote, on the other hand, the absence of mens rea really consists in an honest and reasonable belief entertained by the accused of the existence of facts which, if true, would make the act changed against him innocent, end quote. The onus would therefore be on the accused to show not merely that he did not know that Pierre was an interdicted person, but also that he, the accused, had used honest and reasonable efforts to become acquainted with the information supplied by the department and to comply therein, and that notwithstanding such efforts, he had an honest and reasonable belief that Pierre was not an interdicted person. In an early Saskatchewan Court of Appeal decision in the Queen and Regina Cold Storage and Forwarding, it was held that mens rea was an essential element for conviction and that element was absent. Chief Justice Haltane appears to have conceptualized absence of mens rea, not as lack of knowledge or intent, but rather in terms of reasonable care and an offense of strict liability. He said absence of mens rea means an honest and reasonable belief by the accused in the existence of facts which, if true, would make the charge against him innocent. In the New Brunswick case of the Queen and A.O. Pope Limited, Circuit Court Justice Kirstead held that the offense was one of strict but not absolute liability, and a defense of reasonable care was open to the accused to prove that the act was done without negligence or fault on his part. An appeal to the New Brunswick Supreme Court Appeal Division was dismissed, however, without any discussion of this issue. Two more recent cases, one being from the province of Ontario and another from the province of Alberta, deserve attention. In the Queen and Hickey, the divisional court held that the offense was one of strict liability, but that the accused would have a valid defense if he proved on the balance of probabilities that he honestly believed on reasonable grounds in a mistaken set of facts which, if true, would have made his conduct innocent. The accused had testified that he honestly believed because of the speedometer reading that he was not exceeding the speed limit. A test conducted by a police officer at the scene showed that the speedometer was in fact not working properly. The majority of the court therefore set aside the conviction. The decision in Hickey was subsequently appealed to the Court of Appeal. The court allowed the appeal and restored the conviction. Mr. Justice Jessup, in giving judgment for the court, said, assuming, without deciding, that statutory offenses can be classified into one of three groups mentioned by Justice S.D., in his judgment given in the divisional court, we are of the opinion that the offense here in question of speeding under the Highway Traffic Act is a statutory offense within the third group mentioned by Justice S.D. that is one of absolute liability in the sense that reasonable mistake of fact is not a defense. No reasons were given for the identification of the offense as one of absolute liability once the three groups of statutory offenses were assumed to exist. In the appellate division of the Alberta Supreme Court, the defense of reasonable care for an offense of strict liability was accepted after full consideration of the issues involved, in the recent case of the Queen and Service Limited. 
The offense in question was that an employer shall not permit a person under the full age of 18 years to work during the period of time prohibited by this section. Mr. Justice Morrow, writing for the majority of the court, said, While the language of the particular regulation under review does, in my view, come within the category of absolute or strict liability offenses, I am also of the opinion that the general language used, particularly with the inclusion of the word permit, which has a connotation suggesting some intent is to be considered, brings this section into what probably can be described as the exception to the rule of absoluteness as suggested by Justice Esty in his dissenting judgment in the Queen and Hickey, where he describes statutes which prohibit a specified act or omission, but which are interpreted to permit the defense of an honest belief held on reasonable grounds in a mistaken set of facts which, if true, would render the act or omission innocent. The above exception or type of defense has long been recognized in Australia. It is interesting to note the recommendations made by the Law Reform Commission to the Minister of Justice in March 1976. The Commission advises that every offense outside the Criminal Code be recognized as admitting of a defense of due diligence in the case of any such offense for which intent or recklessness is not specifically required, the onus of proof should lie on the defendant to establish such defense. The defendant would have to prove this on the preponderance or balance of probabilities. The recommendation endorsed a working paper in which it was stated that negligence should be the minimum standard of liability in regulatory offenses, that such offenses were to promote higher standards of care in business, trade and industry, higher standards of honesty in commerce and advertising, higher standards of respect for the environment, and therefore the offense is basically and typically an offense of negligence, that an accused should never be convicted of a regulatory offense if he establishes that he acted with due diligence, that is, that he was not negligent. In the working paper, the Commission further stated, let us recognize the regulatory offense for what it is, an offense of negligence, and frame the law to ensure that guilt depends on lack of reasonable care. The view is expressed that in regulatory law, to make the defendant disprove negligence, prove due diligence, would be both justifiable and desirable. In an interesting article on the matter now under discussion, Professor Jobson refers to a series of recent cases arising principally under Section 32.1 of the Ontario Water Resources Commission Act the section at issue in the present proceedings, which openly acknowledged a defense based on lack of fault or neglect. These cases require proof of the actus reus, but then permit the accused to show that he was without fault or had no opportunity to prevent the harm. The paramount case in the series is the Queen and Industrial Tankers Limited, in which Judge Sprague, relying on the Queen and Hawinda Taverns Limited and the Queen and Bruin Hotel Company Limited, held that the Crown did not need to prove that the accused had mens rea, but it did have to show that the accused had the power and authority to prevent the pollution and could have prevented it, but did not do so. Liability rests upon control and the opportunity to prevent, i.e. that the accused could have and should have prevented the pollution. In industrial tankers, the burden was placed on the Crown to prove lack of reasonable care. To that extent, industrial tankers and Section 32.1 cases which followed it, such as the Queen and Sheridan, differ from other authorities on Section 32.1, which would place upon the accused the burden of showing as a defense that he did not have control or otherwise could not have prevented the impairment. The element of control, particularly by those in charge of business activities which may endanger the public, is vital to promote the observance of regulations designed to avoid that danger. This control may be exercised by supervision or inspection, by improvement of his business methods, or by exhorting those whom he may be expected to influence or control. The purpose, Dean Roscoe Pound has said, is to put pressure upon the thoughtless and inefficient to do their whole duty in the interest of public health or safety or morale. As Justice Devlin noted in Reynolds and Austin and Sons Limited, a man may be responsible for the acts of his servants or even for defects in his business arrangements because it can fairly be said that by such sanctions citizens are induced to keep themselves and their organizations up to the mark. 
Justice Devlin added, however, if a man is punished because of an act done by another, whom he cannot reasonably be expected to influence or control, the law is engaged, not in punishing thoughtlessness or inefficiency, and thereby promoting the welfare of the community, but in pouncing on the most convenient victim. The decision of this court in the Queen and Pierce Fisheries Limited is not inconsistent with the concept of a halfway house between mens rea and absolute liability. In Pierce Fisheries, the charge was that of having possession of undersized lobsters, contrary to the regulations of the Fisheries Act. Two points arise in connection with the judgment of Justice Ritchie, who wrote for the majority of the court. First, the adoption of what had been said by the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Queen and P.K. Smallwares Limited. Quote, if on a prosecution for the offence created by the Act, the Crown had to prove the evil intent of the accused, or if the accused could escape by denying such evil intent, the statute, by which it was obviously intended that there should be complete control without the possibility of any leaks, would have so many holes in it that in truth it would be nothing more than a legislative sev. End quote. Justice Ritchie held that the offense was one in which the Crown, for the reasons indicated in the P.K. Smallware's case, did not have to prove mens rea in order to obtain a conviction. This, in my opinion, is the ratio digendi of the case. Second, Justice Ritchie did not, however, foreclose the possibilities of a defense. The following passage from the judgment suggests that a defense of reasonable care might have been open to the accused, but that in that case care had not been taken to acquire the knowledge of the facts constituting the offense. Quote, as employees of the company working on the premises in the shed where fishes weighed and packed were taking lobsters from boxes preparatory for packing in crates, and as some of the undersized lobsters were found in crates ready for shipment, it would not appear to have been a difficult matter for some officer or responsible employee to acquire knowledge of their presence on the premises. In a later passage, Justice Ritchie added, quote, in this case, the respondent knew that it had upwards of 60,000 pounds of lobsters on its premises. It only lacked knowledge as to the small size of some of them, and I do not think that the failure of any of its reasonable employees to acquire this knowledge affords any defense to a charge of violating the provisions of Section 31B of the Lobster Fishery Regulations. I do not read Pierce Fisheries as denying the accused all defenses, in particular the defense that the company had done everything possible to acquire knowledge of the undersized lobsters. Justice Ritchie concluded merely that the Crown did not have to prove knowledge. The judgment of this court in Hill and the Queen has been interpreted as imposing absolute liability and denying the driver of a motor vehicle the right to plead in defense an honest and reasonable belief in a state of facts which, if true, would have made the act non-culpable. In Hill, the appellant was charged under the Highway Traffic Act with failing to remain at the scene of an accident. Her car had touched the rear of another vehicle. She did not stop but drove off, believing no damage had been done. This court affirmed the conviction, holding that the offense was not one requiring mens rea. In that case, the essential fact was that an accident had occurred, to the knowledge of Mrs. Hill. Any belief she may have had as to the extent of the damage could not obliterate that fact, or make it appear that she had reasonable grounds for believing in a state of facts which, if true, would have constituted a defense to the charge. The case does not stand in the way of a defense of reasonable care in a proper case. We have the situation, therefore, in which many courts of this country, at all levels, dealing with public welfare offenses, favor one, not requiring the Crown to prove mens rea, two, rejecting the notion that liability inexorably follows upon mere proof of the actus reus, excluding any possible defense. The courts are following the lead set in Australia many years ago and tentatively broached by several English courts in recent years. It may be suggested that the introduction of a defense based on due diligence and the shifting of the burden of proof might be better implemented by legislative act. In answer, it should be recalled that the concept of absolute liability and the creation of a jural category of public welfare offenses are both the product of the judiciary and not of the legislature. The development to date of this defense in the numerous decisions I have referred to of courts in this country as well as in Australia and New Zealand has also been the work of judges. The present case offers the opportunity of consolidating and clarifying the doctrine. 
The correct approach, in my opinion, is to relieve the Crown of the burden of proving mens rea, having regard to Pierce Fisheries and to the virtual impossibility in most regulatory cases of proving wrongful intention. In a normal case, the accused alone will have knowledge of what he has done to avoid the breach and it is not improper to expect him to come forward with this evidence of due diligence. This is particularly so when it is alleged, for example, that pollution was caused by the activities of a large and complex corporation. Equally, there is nothing wrong with rejecting absolute liability and admitting the defense of reasonable care. In this doctrine, it is not up to the prosecution to prove negligence. Instead, it is open to the defendant to prove that all due care has been taken. This burden falls upon the defendant as he is the only one who will generally have the means of proof. This would not seem unfair, as the alternative is absolute liability which denies an accused any defense whatsoever. While the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the prohibited act, the defendant must only establish on a balance of probabilities that he has a defense of reasonable care. I conclude for the reasons which I have sought to express that there are compelling grounds for the recognition of three categories of offenses rather than the traditional two. 1. Offenses in which mens rea, consisting of some positive state of mind such as intent, knowledge, or recklessness, must be proved by the prosecution, either as an inference from the nature of the act committed or by additional evidence. 2. Offenses in which there is no necessity for the prosecution to prove the existence of mens rea. The doing of the prohibited act prima facie imports the offense, leaving it open to the accused to avoid liability by proving that he took all reasonable care. This involves consideration of what a reasonable man would have done in the circumstances. The defense will be available if the accused reasonably believed in a mistaken set of facts which, if true, would render the act or omission innocent or if he took all reasonable steps to avoid the particular event. These offenses may properly be called offenses of strict liability. Mr. Justice Esty so referred to them in Hickey's case. 3. Offenses of absolute liability where it is not open to the accused to exculpate himself by showing that he was free of fault. Offenses which are criminal in the true sense fall in the first category public welfare offenses would prima facie be in the second category. They are not subject to the presumption of full mens rea. An offense of this type would fall in the first category only if such words as willfully, with intent, knowingly, or intentionally are contained in the statutory provision creating the offense. On the other hand, the principle that punishment should in general not be inflicted on those without fault applies. Offenses of absolute liability would be those in respect of which the legislature had made it clear that guilt would follow proof merely of the prescribed act. The overall regulatory pattern adopted by the legislature, the subject matter of the legislation, the importance of the penalty, and the precision of the language used will be primary considerations in determining whether the offense falls into the third category. The Ontario Water Resources Commission Act, Section 32.1. Turning to the subject matter of Section 32.1, the prevention of pollution of lakes, rivers, and streams, it is patent that this is of great public concern. Pollution has always been unlawful and in itself a nuisance. A riparian owner has an inherent right to have a stream of water come to him in its natural state in flow, quantity, and quality. Natural streams, which formerly afforded pure and healthy water for drinking or swimming purposes, became little more than cesspools when riparian factory owners and municipal corporations discharged into them filth of all descriptions. Pollution offenses are undoubtedly public welfare offenses enacted in the interests of public health. There is thus no presumption of a full mens rea. There is another reason, however, why this offense is not subject to a presumption of mens rea. The presumption applies only to offenses which are criminal in the true sense as Justice Ritchie said in the Queen and Pierce Fisheries. The Ontario Water Resource Commission Act is a provincial statute. If it is validly provincial legislation, and no suggestion was made to the contrary, then it cannot possibly create an offence which is criminal in the true sense. The present case concerns the interpretation of two troublesome words frequently found in the public welfare statutes, cause and permit. 
These two words are troublesome because neither denotes clearly either full mens rea nor absolute liability. It is said that a person could not be said to be permitting something unless he knew what he was permitting. This is an oversimplification. There is authority both ways, indicating that the courts are uneasy with the traditional dichotomy. Some authorities favor the position that permit does not import mens rea. The same is true of cause. Others say that cause imports a requirement for mens rea. The Divisional Court of Ontario relied on these latter authorities in concluding that Section 32.1 created a mens rea offense. The conflict in the above authorities, however, shows that in themselves the words cause and permit fit much better into an offense of strict liability than either full mens rea or absolute liability. Since 32.1 creates a public welfare offense without a clear indication that liability is absolute, and without any words such as knowingly or willfully expressly to import mens rea, application of the criteria which I have outlined above undoubtedly places the offense in the category of strict liability. Proof of the prohibited act prima facie imports the offense, but the accused may avoid liability by proving that he took reasonable care. I am strengthened in this view by the recent case of the Queen and Cervico Limited in which the appellate division of the Alberta Supreme Court held that an offense of permitting a person under 18 years to work during prohibited hours was an offense of strict liability in the sense which I have described. It will also be recalled that the decisions of many lower courts which have considered Section 32.1 have rejected absolute liability as the basis for the offense of causing or permitting pollution, and have equally rejected full mens rea as an ingredient of the offense. The present case. As I am of the view that a new trial is necessary, it would be inappropriate to discuss at this time the facts of the present case. It may be helpful, however, to consider in a general way the principles to be applied in determining whether a person or municipality has committed the actus reus of discharging, causing, or permitting pollution within the terms of Section 32.1, in particular in connection with pollution from garbage disposal. The prohibited act would, in my opinion, be committed by those who undertake the collection and disposal of garbage, who are in a position to exercise continued control of this activity and prevent the pollution from occurring, but fail to do so. The discharging aspect of the offense centers on direct acts of pollution. The causing aspect centers on the defendant's active undertaking of something which it is in a position to control and which results in pollution. The permitting aspect of the offense centers on the defendant's passive lack of interference or, in other words, its failure to prevent an occurrence which it ought to have foreseen. The close interweaving of the meanings of these terms emphasizes again that Section 32.1 deals with only one generic offense. When the defendant is a municipality, it is of no avail to it in the law that it had no duty to pick up the garbage, merely providing that it may do so. The law is replete with instances where a person has no duty to act, but where he is subject to certain duties if he does act. The duty here is imposed by Section 32.1 of the Ontario Water Resources Commission Act. The position in this respect is no different from that of a private person, corporate or individual, who have no duty to dispose of garbage, but who will incur liability under Section 32.1 if they do so, and thereby discharge, cause, or permit pollution. Nor does liability rest solely on the terms of any agreement by which a defendant arranges for eventual disposal. The test is a factual one, based on an assessment of the defendant's position with respect to the activity which it undertakes and which causes pollution. If it can and should control the activity at the point where pollution occurs, then it is responsible for the pollution. Whether it discharges, causes, or permits the pollution will be a question of degree depending on whether it is actively involved at the point where pollution occurs, or whether it merely passively fails to prevent the pollution. In some cases, the contract may expressly provide the defendant with the power and authority to control the activity. In such a case, the factual assessment will be straightforward. Prima facie liability will be incurred where the defendant could have prevented the impairment by intervening pursuant to its right to do so under the contract, but failed to do so. Where there is no such express provision in the contract, other factors will come into greater prominence. 
In every instance, the question will depend on an assessment of all the circumstances of the case. Whether an independent contractor rather than an employee is hired will not be decisive. A homeowner who pays a fee for the collection of his garbage by a business which services the area could probably not be said to have caused or permitted the pollution if the collector dumps the garbage in the river. His position would be analogous to a householder in Sault Ste. Marie, who could not be said to have caused or permitted the pollution here. A large corporation which arranges for the nearby disposal of industrial pollutants by a small local independent contractor with no experience in this matter would probably be in an entirely different position. It must be recognized, however, that a municipality is in a somewhat different position by virtue of the legislative power which it possesses and which others lack. This is important in the assessment of whether the defendant was in a position to control the activity which it undertook and which caused the pollution. A municipality cannot slough off responsibility by contracting out the work. It is in a position to control those whom it hires to carry out garbage disposal operations and to supervise the activity, either through the provisions of the contract or by municipal bylaws. It fails to do so at its peril. One comment on the defense of reasonable care in this context should be added. Since the issue is whether the defendant is guilty of an offense, the doctrine of respondeat superior has no application. The due diligence which must be established is that of the accused alone. Where an employer is charged with respect of an act committed by an employee acting in the course of employment, the question will be whether the act took place without the accused direction or approval, thus negating willful involvement of the accused, and whether the accused exercised all reasonable care by establishing a proper system to prevent commission of the offense and by taking reasonable steps to ensure the effective operation of the system. The availability of the defense to a corporation will depend on whether such due diligence was taken by those who are the directing mind and the will of the corporation, whose acts are therefore in law the acts of the corporation itself. For a useful discussion of this matter in the context of a statutory defense of due diligence, see Tesco Supermarkets and Natras. The majority of the Ontario Court of Appeal directed a new trial as, in the opinion of that court, the findings of the trial judge were not sufficient to establish actual knowledge on the part of the city. I share the view that there should be a new trial, but for a different reason. The city did not lead evidence directed to a defense of due diligence nor did the trial judge address himself to the availability of such a defense. In these circumstances, it would not be fair for this court to determine upon findings of fact directed towards other ends, whether the city was without fault. I would dismiss the appeal and direct a new trial. I would dismiss the cross appeal. There should be no costs. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.